Hello and welcome to 365 Days Towards Racial Change. My name is Thomas Nyback. We're here talking about black issues in America. Now, when I say black issues, I don't, I'm not necessarily, I'm not a representative of all black people. Definitely talk about my black issues in, uh, in America. Uh, things that have I, I've encountered. There are some common denominators, uh, slavery, history, economics uh, can definitely bring us together quickly. I probably diverge when it comes to music and um, some of the things that go on in the black community. Yet, I wear the color, therefore, uh, externally, I'm lumped in uh, to those uh, circles as well. I want, I'm, I'm at the bottom line, I want the individual to come on their own, uh, on their own merits, you know. There are a lot of issues. That's why it's taken a year kind of to get this argument uh, underway. And, and maybe at the end of the year, we'll still have only cr scratched the surface and uh, encountered the basics of racism, slavery, economic marginalization and oppression, um, <laughs> dominance of other societies, institutions, and groups uh, based on their color. Uh, a, lot, a lot of aspects, a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> Two thoughts emerging as this project continues. First thought is, does the black mind of slavery, um, is there, does the black mind have a sense of insecurity? I, I, don't, I don't mention this, I don't think enough. Uh, I know sometimes when I'm out in public, there's a sense that I, I feel unsafe at times. You know, I, I don't like law enforcement around. I don't like guns, period. And uh, so, so there's some of, some of that that I go through. Um, when you see, you just don't see white folks getting slapped around in public and shot in public uh, to the degree you see black folks uh, having it done to them by uh, white male police officers. Uh, so that's one thing about that. So, uh, you know, feeling um, insecure in society. Uh, feeling uh, is the slave mind of uh, slavery and uh, uh, some of the uh, illiteracy that comes from that. When I say illiteracy, not just reading, but illiterate and, and knowing how the power structure works, operates, and moves, uh, how it feeds itself, uh, you know, Literacy has to go beyond just being able to read letters on a page. It's, it's social literacy, other literacies we're going to get to in a moment. And conversely, the, the flip side of the same coin is does the white mind of entitlement, privilege, go on? Is that being passed along um, in a very casual, nonchalant way to white folks, you know, I have I have conversation with white people that I just don't have with black folks, you know, and in those conversations, I, I kind of, I'll just kind of drop a few seeds to gather some information and they can ramble on about the things that are incredible to me, <laughs> but they, uh, you know, areas of life they've mastered, um, at an early age that they've already talked about around the dinner table with their uh, family members that, you know, there's more, uh, I see more of a uh, effort uh, to preserve, you know, we can say white culture, but just culture in general, I should, I, I really want to say, but it just happens to uh, happen among white people? What are black people passing on culturally to one another? That's the first thought. Second thought, back to literacy, financial literacy. Do we understand what well, what's expendable income? Where is our income being spent? Uh, when we read the labels on our clothing and our 
electronic devices, where is that stuff being made? You know, financial literacy, you know, assets, liabilities, corporate structures, tax laws. Now, these are important things. They're not taught in school. I'm having to gather this on my own. Um, uh, guys like Robert Kiyosaki, other mentors, other uh, men and women willing to be transparent about financial literacy tend to agree that uh, th this financial literacy education is lacking in the school system. I'm weighing heavily on that's by design. You, you know, you want to keep a people, look at, look at slavery. You know, if you want to keep a people really marginalized, really in the dark, really thinking that this privilege is kind of a godlike status, keep them ignorant. Keep them um, away from learning about how things are really working around them. You know, uh, you know I guess, it, you know, it's easy to by force make all these um, laws and hurdles that a person has to go through. But if you can just keep them ignorant, that they're going to self-police themselves right out of the uh, opportunities and privileges that you exercise. Uh, very interesting thing. We can do a piece on that in the future. I'm uh, informed by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. I uh, came in contact through a mutual friend of ours. Although he doesn't know me, I, I'm just, I just love his work. He's here on YouTube, and I bought three of his books and devoured them instantaneously. And it's, uh, it's where we get a lot of our material uh, through this year. First book. A Black History Reader, 101 Questions We Never Thought to Ask. Second book, Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power in Economics, Economic Justice, and Dr. Anderson's National Plan to Empower Black America, Poweronomics. You can find Dr. Anderson at poweronomics.com, and he, uh, I guess, is at the Heritage Institute in Washington, D.C., um, so he, he speaks actually much better on these points. Missing a little bit of the specific financial literacy elements, but, but you know, black folks really need to appreciate their history. Uh, but kind of the route I took, appreciating the history, uh, the, the devices, um, lack of reparations, some of those things, we need that literacy. Uh, our, our heritage literacy to to then come to desire some financial literacy in America. It's the information age. Uh, it's not hard to find the truth out there. Behind me, you see hashtag us too. Um, you can find black women um, discoursing, supporting each other there, but it's open for us where everybody chimes in. Uh, you go to Black Enough, B-L-A-G-G-E-N-U-F, and you can find uh, kind of a Black Facebook, more support there. We also have story time. We're almost finished our series on the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and uh, we look at Harriet Beecher Stowe's work every once in a while, see how Uncle Tom and the other slaves, the slave masters and slave handlers are getting along. All right, we're in uh, day 117, looking, we got a lot of W's here. Uh, we got three Williams, we got four W's. Interesting, uh, this is all alphabetical. I love how that it's coming out. Both are Congregationalists. Um, <laughs> uh, as far as their religions, both merchants to a degree. Let's, let's talk. To them and see what's going on. First, a uh, representative from New Hampshire, William Whipple, and uh, 
He is uh, he was born 1730, died 1785. Um, emerged from New Hampshire. Uh, now he he profited. He was another guy that profited. You, you know you notice how it, uh, especially well in the world. There are super rich people you, you never see, you never hear about at all. They're just living the life they ain't worried about. Because, you know, uh, publicity and, and visibility, and, you know, like you see the movie stars and, and, and television stars, game shows, sports people, you know, that's... You don't see the people that make money off of the people doing that. You know that that kind of uh, very uh, exclusive society, and we I think we've come across that numerous times. These fifty six signers of the Declaration of Independence. You know, not, not you know Benjamin Franklin and stuff like that. The fireworks and the, the superstars, rock stars of the Declaration of Independence. But you had the guys making loads of money behind the scenes, not as very visible uh, public image and all this stuff. So William Whipple is one of those guys. He profited from the um, uh, the triangle trade. Now, now he here's a divided guy. He's a merchant. Now, the triangle trade, we talked about that just a few days ago uh, in relation with another signer. Triangle trade is you get your raw goods and resources from the colonies. That goes to England, is processed into linens. Now, we're talking big, bulk, major stuff. You know, eat, sure, every place I'm going to talk about had their little industries. But we're talking about the boatloads of resources went to England and England through the, their infrastructure as far as industrialized infrastructure to process these uh, materials, the sugars, cottons, and things like that, tobaccos, loaded them up, took them down to Africa for trade and everything, and then those boats are loaded with uh, African slaves and come back uh, to the States. It was a clockwise motion around the uh, Atlantic Ocean following the Atlantic current and the winds and stuff like that. Uh, they call it the Triangle. Colonies, England, Africa, colonies, England, Africa. Triangle trade. He benefited from that. Now he's divided because uh, he's a congregational church, uh, one of the church leading uh, the abolitionist voice at the time. And he was actually, uh, you know, part of that. You know, uh, he <laughs> he owned a slave. He, he emancipated his slave. Uh, he wrote. Uh, you'll see it more exact in the brief notes in the description of this video. Uh, but you know, he was of the, the mind that I like to see. Like he said, how can uh, we uh, sever something like sever ourselves? From our oppressors, and then become uh, become an oppressor, which is what I've been kind of reiterating through this series. You know, the, this kind of the colonies overwhelmingly, and in general, they severed themselves from England, but that did a 180 degree turn and put slavery on steroids and oppressed people simply based on their skin color. Um, sad, but th this is one of the guys, uh, he's one of less than a handful of guys that is explicit about how wrong slavery is, even though he's benefiting and enriching himself from the trade. Uh, he signed to kind of come at and counteract, um, uh, the erosion of the bottom line on his trade profits. Next guy up, William Williams. So we had William Whipple, William Williams, both Congregationalists. You know, both, uh, I believe now, William Williams doesn't have a, 
any explicit commentary on slavery. Remember, we're coming from Wikipedia here, very good resource, but I'm not reading biographies and huge textbooks like that, but uh, I'm trusting the resource. William Williams, born 1731, died 1811. And uh, this is our first, like, uh, declared clergyman here. And now, you got to think, back then, everybody probably dabbled in the Bible, new verses, the, the Bible what was a, a common textbook back then, you know, it, and it, it, it kind of shaped the values and things like that. Very interesting. Not not the America we have today by any degree. But uh, uh, this guy, you know, fully penetrated, wanted to increase further a relationship with God. So he was actually a pastor and studied uh, hard. Also, a merchant as well. Um he was a, uh, also he was another late signer to the declaration. He wasn't four months late like uh, one of our guys a day or two ago, but uh, he was a couple days late, you know, apparently. You, you know, the, the signing was an endorsement, an affirmation of the prevailing colonial thought, you know, so he, he didn't, I necessarily have to be there present uh, for the validation, you know, you have to, vote. You have to be present to vote, the, the uh, finding out that the signatures are the affirmations uh, of the document. Uh, Congregationalist, he actually, uh, first congregational church, he represented Connecticut, and uh, so kind of after his career, he he spent time in the militia, uh, remember the French and Indian War is happening, and uh, there's, uh, each colony's got its militia to be that buffer against the uh, warfare spilling over into the colonies. Uh, so he was part of the militia, Connecticut militia, for a while, and uh, but it seemed like when his life finally calmed down, he was able to finally pursue his passion and uh, be, a, he pastored a first congregational church somewhere, I think Lebanon, Connecticut is where that occurred. Uh, he signed, now here's the thing, another interesting little tidbit. Um, as far as England was concerned, they, they were not, they were, you know, the, the court the crown is insulated uh, from some of the ills and the complaints of the outside world. You know, it's one of the things uh, that brought on uh, some of the changes in France, the Bastille, and all that. I went to, uh, let me just digress just for a moment. I went to a uh, exhibit where they showed... Um, some of the, the kitchen utensils and silverware that the French court used to, uh, you know, at their meal times and stuff like that. When the people outside are just starving, and the, the community, the general community, is uh, just has some legitimate grievances as the people inside are eating well. One I know one of the. Uh, uh, the men of the French court at the time is, if my history's right, is, you know, if they can't get cake, let them eat grass or something like that. And I, the story goes, he was eventually captured, and they, before he's, you know, had his head chopped off, you know, he's pictured with grass and stuff in his mouth. Uh, so, you know, getting back to the English court, the English crown, you know, they're, they're the same insulated bunch, and at, they just, you know, they take ownership of whatever resources are coming out of the colonies and don't have much 
sympathy for the colonists, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, as especially what is often, unfortunately, the case when uh, younger generations of privilege come up, they're even further removed uh, from what uh, makes uh, their privileged position possible. And they are a little more abrasive and unsympathetic to what's going on uh, outside their circle, their in insulated circle. No change here. Uh, look at Wikipedia. There, uh, there's a, a quote that uh, William Williams wrote in response to these continuing, uh, continuing tax increases and you know, uh, oppression, the pressure from England. Uh, you know, they, they send grievances to the crown. The response is that the colonists are traitors and rebels and we're, we're going to chain you up and drag you back across the ocean uh, for punishment and whatnot. And, uh, you know, those that kind of thing, uh, you just don't say that... Uh, to people suffering, I, you know, I think it's, and to some degree, I've been guilty of being uh, apathetic towards those around me when I get in position. That's my own, own little self <laughs> uh, self crimination there, some uh, confession for you. But I think everybody at some point has done it. You know, hopefully, in a soft age. That's kind of caught up with me you know, so I can see the wisdom looking back, you know, to be a little more sensitive <laughs> when there are issues out there. Uh, so, you know, the, doing the research on William Williams, you know, gave me a snapshot into something we've, we've been hinting at, but in Wikipedia there is... Uh, uh, some verifiable exchanges there between apathy, sympathy, and trying to be heard and all that, you know. You know, and over, overall, I, I've been starting to think about this as this project continues. It, it, it's the same for black folks or any aggrieved group anywhere that there's also there's this sense of you know who, who do I turn to and, and this goes to uh, back to literacy how does the system work how do I engage it uh, to get my needs met you know I'm not I'm not even trying to uh, prosper yet you know uh, but I, I'm running into barriers and gatekeepers and situations that are keeping me extremely at a disadvantage and I need to know how to navigate what's the language uh, who are who are my potential allies things like that you know the colonists know this you know uh, and we'll say uh, people lacking altruistic motives, uh, you know, could use some of these exchanges in the history to, to, uh, uh, to further solidify, especially some mental conditioning against black folks being shipped over here from Africa. You know, they, they could use it in hindsight. Okay, we, you know, we did this, this didn't work. This made us feel further disadvantaged. Well, this could be a perfect tool to use against this group that we want to keep enslaved and ignorant. You know, possibly. I don't. I don't have any research to back that up, but it kind of would make sense. You know, whether the men or the people involved were that smart and articulate. Uh, some of the research does suggest that the, the education level was not that great uh, among slave masters, but 
you know, you did have these signers of the Declaration, uh, plantation owners did have successful ones, especially with larger plantations, needed to have kind of a good head on their shoulders and possibly have learned going to a school somewhere for business organization skills, things like that. Uh, so there was higher learning there. And I'm sure that I'm, I'm guessing these guys would show up and, and help uh, further marginalize the slaves. Uh, so much is lost there. See, this is the information age now. So the uh, we can go back, you know, God forbid I contradict myself too much here because it's recorded now, permanent record. Uh, we're watching the, uh, the Democratic race heating up. Joe Biden has finally stepped in. He did a lot of housekeeping. I, I like what he did, actually. You know, whatever, however you feel. But you got to appreciate he did a lot of management and housekeeping before he got into the race. He, he really attack the women issues and stuff like that. So a lot of stuff that kind of comes up <laughs> later on, he's either dealt with or, you know, it's too late. You know, he's uh, got in there into the reporting cycle and it's already cycled and it's been resolved and stuff. So it's, it's kind of old hat, <laughs> you know, he, he's very ingenious the way he did it. Uh, we'll see what happens in there. Uh, uh, I won't endorse anybody. I think I already have in past videos, but uh, not today. Not today. Listen, we're, going, we're just, uh, I'm not going to run you out of time. I'll hold you hostage. I'm starting to ramble here. But that's it. We got uh, just a day or two more to go. And take a break and do some uh, get to Uncle Tom's cabin. Thanks for sticking with me. I, again, I'm Tom Lindsay Nyback, and that's 365 days towards racial change, day 117 out of the way.